Okay. Welcome all of you uh, to this Saturday club. So basically Saturday club is an brainstorming of interdisciplinary approaches and interdisciplinary thoughts in science and all other domains. So the Ayush Center of Excellence, Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, School of Health Sciences of Pune University, organizes this Saturday club every first Saturday of every month. So this time we have with us Professor Surendra Gaskadbi, and he is going to talk about regeneration in, in Hydra. So I re request uh, our intern, Sanika Guzar, to introduce about uh, Sir, and then we'll start with the talk. Introducing uh, Surendra Gaskadbi, Sir. Uh, he's been associated with the Development Biological Group of uh, Agarkar Research Institute. He's been the president of uh, Indian Society of Cell Biology and the Indian Society of Developmental Biologists. His research funds have been funded by uh, various known organizations like DST, DBT, CS CSIR, and DAE, uh, also the Indo-Japan grant. Uh, Dr. Gaskadbi, sir, has journals of uh, several national and international collaborations. So now I would like to call uh, Dr. Gaskadbi, sir, to continue his lecture. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. This is one department where um, I have not given a dose of Hydra to anybody. So, you know, I've been speaking about this organism for a very long time. So it's a real pleasure. It's nice to have Dr. Dev. I've been associated with his moving academy for quite a few years. So I'm going to talk about an organism which I have been working for the past 20 years or so. So Hydra is a tiny organism, about a centimeter in length, Okay, lives in fresh water, and it's a cylindrical organism. If you cut Hydra, take a small cut at the head, it develops two heads. If you take two cuts, it develops four heads. And that means it becomes multi-headed after some time. It still is alive. And unfortunately, because of that quality of Hydra, it has derived its name from, a, from Greek mythology, wherein Hydra is a monster. And you can see here King Hercules trying to kill Hydra. But there is nothing monstrous about the organism that I work with, except probably for its prey. And I'll just tell you how nice and delicate and useful that organism is. Uh, so all of you may not be from the same zoology background. So to put things in perspective, let me tell you where Hydra belongs in the entire tree of animal life. So, uh, you know, our common ancestor is Prochis of all organisms. And in multicellular organisms, unlike the, you know, bacteria and viruses, when cells come together and form a multicellular organism, the first phylum that we study is Porifera, to which sponges belong. And that is believed to have evolved over 700 million years back. After that, the second phylum that one studies in zoology is phylum Nidaria, to which jellyfish, corals, and hydra belong. Okay? And this is a phylum in which all the animals are diploblastic. So they have only ectoderm and endoderm. Unlike us, we are triploblastic. As you know, we also have mesoderm. So diploblastic organisms are relatively structurally less complex than triploblastic organisms. So these are the Nidarians here, and they have evolved somewhere uh, after this. Interestingly, before the Nidarians arose, came into existence in evolution, nerve cells make their appearance for the first time. So sponges do not have true neurons. Only this phylum shows the beginning of appearance of neurons. 
and therefore hydra is very important from the point of view of how brains develop and hydra has a very simple nervous system unlike us we have a very complex nervous system hydra is a nerve net which is spread all over its body so because it has nerve cells it started active feeding which is supposed to be a very important step in evolution so what happens in case of sponges water passes through sponges and the sponge cells pick up food particles by phagocytosis but because hydra has nervous system it can actually sense the environment sense the prey it can poison the prey and eat it so active feeding has come about for the first time in phylum nidaria uh, so that's a very important step because sensing the environment looking for food and actually engulfing it is a very major step so from th that point of view because of the appearance of the first organized nervous system and first active feeding obviously biologists have been extremely interested in this organism this organism came to be known to science because of a scientist abraham tremblay okay and this was in 1744 so hydra is known to science for a very long time abraham tremblay actually was a mathematician interested in infinities but he was also interested in aquatic insects and in his free time he would go and look for insects so that time a mathematician not being allowed to study insects was not there those compartments we have made now that time anybody could study anything so abraham tremblay once he was when he was looking for insects he found some very strange white tube floating in water he brought them to the lab and that turned out to be an organism called hydra what tremblay did was he cut this hydra so if this is hydra he cut it with a sharp blade and this was done on 25th of november 1740 and within a few days he found that the two pieces regenerated fully so there are many firsts in this case first time regeneration in animals was demonstrated by um, tremblay second thing he could bring an organism which lives in water for the first time to the lab people used to bring many terrestrial animals like insects mice and so on So this was the first time that somebody could bring and actually maintain aquatic organism in the lab. Not only that, he could experiment with this and could observe it for many days. Because of its strange and very interesting character, Tremblay actually sent this organism to various labs in Europe through the postal system. So this was the very first for uh, zoology, and this this was considered to be. the birth of marine zoology although hydra is a freshwater organism it is considered to be the birth of marine zoology and therefore it has a big place in history of science and the uh, organism caught imagination of people in the entire european region and many people actually traveled to tremblay's lab to see his polyps this is hydra is a polyp and it became a kind of fashion to say that no i have seen tremblay's polyps and it caught the imagination of people and one artist even came out with a special edition showing hydra as dancing human figures so it became a real rage to see hydra we have many such fashions these days we go and uh, you know travel to look for something interesting hydra was such thing that time so this is the tremblay effect or the birth of marine zoology and all this has been you know very uh, reviewed very well in a article about 10 years back these are the hydra that i have in the lab so this is a culture of hydra from a single polyp that i collected in the year 2000 from a pond in botany department garden okay so that single hydra i am still using i mean that hydra is gone it is reproducing but this culture is there for the last 23 years and i have a technician technical officer uh, rohin londe who has even managed to maintain them during covid times when the lab was closed she carried them home used the um, you know cooler fed them and kept them alive so this is there for 23 years it's a clonal culture uh, that we use so this is known as a brown hydra because it is brownish in color and there are two species of hydra that we get in india this is the one which we have character taxonomically characterized as hydra vulgaris we call it call it as in pune strain indian pune strain another hydra that we get in, in india that is the green hydra it looks green because it has chlorella as endosymbionts so it looks very beautiful but for the work 
the kind of work that we do, cell biology, developmental biology, molecular biology, we use green hydra because we do not want contamination from the chlorella, right? Otherwise, DNA, RNA, everything from chlorella would get mixed up. So we use the brown hydra for our work. So this is the organism. This is the in Pune strain. And I, as I said, in the expanded condition, it could be about one to one and a half centimeters in length. Very thin tube. A hydra has an oral, oral end and aboral end. Oral means from where it feeds. So there is small opening here, mouth-like opening, through which it eats the food and the undigested food is thrown out of the same opening. So only one opening to the body. This is surrounded by a number of tentacles which have stinging cells, which are known as nematocysts. These are present only in nidarians, so only corals, jellyfish. You know, sometimes jellyfish po uh, toxin is very toxic. That is because they have these stinging cells. Or the Portuguese man of war, you must have studied this, an organism uh, which also belong to uh, the same phylum. Hydra has a cylindrical uh, body and it has radial symmetry. Okay, it doesn't have bilateral symmetry like this. We have left, right, it doesn't have that. It has radial symmetry like a starfish, right? It usually reproduces by budding. In fact, because of that, many people initially thought that it's a plant, but actually it's an animal. It re reproduces by budding usually, asexual means of reproduction. But if conditions become unfavorable, it can go for sexual reproduction also. So both of these kinds of reproduction can, in principle, be studied in this organism. And it has a basal disc or a sticky material, uh, sticky organ at the base by which it attaches to the substratum. Usually, hydra doesn't move. You may have seen pictures of hydra doing somersaulting, but that is quite rare. Actually, they are sessile animals. So briefly, this is a diploblast. So you have ectoderm and endoderm, as you can see here. This is the hypostome or the conical mouth uh, here and it has an opening surrounded by tentacles. Then you have head, body column, and foot. That are the, those are the structures of the body. Uh, this is the gastric region. So the food is digested here, and uh, then the undigested food is thrown out here only from this same opening. And these cells around this also secrete the digestive enzymes, but they also absorb the digested material. And some uh, hydra species have a stalk-like structure called bedmutal. We don't have that. Our hydra doesn't have that. And a basal disc. So this is oral end, this is aboral end. It's very interesting that actually the oral end of hydra is not homologous with our head. So this is not head, tail axis or anterior, posterior. Because hydra has certain genes which are present in this region, which are homologous with genes that are responsible for our heart development. So this axis are really different. In, you know, in our case, we have the first axis that develops in development uh, during development is dorsal ventral, the anterior posterior, and finally left right. But hydra has only oral aboral axis and a radial symmetry. Just to give you some more details of structure, you know, I have already described this. If you take a cross section of the body of the hydra, you will see that ectoderm and endoderm. Ectodermal epithelial cells are shown in green. Endodermal epithelial cells are shown in pink. So these are the main cells of the body. And these two layers, ectoderm and endoderm, are separated by a modified basement membrane called as mesoglia. This mesoglia is made up of fibronectin, laminin, and so on. All these connective tissue proteins that we also have in our body. In addition to this, there are certain gland cells which secrete the digestive enzymes into the body cavity here, OK? And in the ectoderm, you have different kinds of nematocytes, the stinging cells that I'm talking about. And you can see here that there is a spine-like structure through which it injects poison in the prey. The prey gets paralyzed. And the tentacles catch the prey and then push the prey into their mouth. We can actually control the number of hydra in the lab by feeding them more and more. So if you feed them more, they bud very fast. They don't know where to stop. In that respect, they are somewhat like me. They don't know where to stop eating. But otherwise, you know, in nature, they don't get so much food and then they survive and reproduce at a, their normal pace. So they also have sensory neurons and ganglionic neurons. We have about 200 different kinds of cells in our body. 
because there is a division of labor in multicellular organisms. Hydra has about 20 to 25. So you can, uh, you know, compare the, it, it's structurally much less complex than a, it also doesn't have mesoderm, as I mentioned already. Another peculiar thing about Hydra is about its cellular dynamics. So Hydra is made up of about 100,000 cells, 1 lakh cells in the entire body. If you label cells somewhere in the middle of the body column, then you will see that the cells migrate towards the two extremities, right? So if this is the hydra, cells here divide, they migrate towards the two extremities, and as they migrate, they also undergo differentiation. And in about 20 days, they reach the two extremities, undergo programmed cell death or apoptosis, and are sloughed off. So about 20% of the body cells of hydra within 20 days are sloughed off, they undergo apoptosis, the remaining 80% actually go into the bud. So you can see here, if you can see the days written here, cells here will enter the buds in about eight days, okay? Cells in the middle of the body column will go here in about 20 days, same case here, and in 20 days they are thrown out. So at given, any given point of time, any cell in Hydra is never more than 20 days old, and therefore, Hydra doesn't age. It doesn't show organismal aging. Okay? And therefore, it is obviously very interesting to biologists. Not only that, to take it further, actually Hydra doesn't show death. It is a potentially immortal organism. Nobody has seen a Hydra dying a natural death. There was a PhD student in Japan who was given a, a polyp to find out its age. And the polyp refused to die for four years. His PhD problem had to be changed. Right? I'm, this is a fact. So there have been certain uh, algorithms people have built about longevity of plants and animals. And according to that paper, which appeared in Nature about five years back, a hydra should be able to live at least for 10,000 years. And obviously, none of us will be there to confirm that. Right? So hydra is potentially immortal. Because it doesn't show organismal aging, it shows cellular aging. In our case, in our case, our cells age, but they are not necessarily thrown out. We also age, and the cellular aging is because of DNA strand breaks, uh, accumulation of uh, reactive oxy oxygen species, and so on. The same things also happen in hydra cells, but the cells are replaced. So the hydra forever remains young. So lack of organismal aging, immortality and in addition to that when we develop so let me just digress a little bit and tell you how we develop we all start each one of us have started our life as a unicellular zygote right when the oocyte of mother was fertilized by father's sperm and that oocyte is of the size of a full stop in your book now that full stop has to be converted into a gaskad how does it do that so initially, there are a number of cellular divisions. And we all started our life as a ball of cells. It looks like a strawberry or bundi colored do, right? Exactly like that. And now that uh, ball of cells has to be converted into a three-dimensional organism. So that's why I mentioned the first dorsal ventral axis is identified. Then anterior posterior left, right. Once dorsal is identified, vertebral column can form at the proper side. Once anterior is developed, brain can form it. We often used to you know, make fun that somebody's brain is here. That's not possible. It is only here because anterior specification of the brain is important. Likewise, the heart usually will loop on the left. Although there are people who are quite normal with a condition called situs invertus. Their heart is on the right hand side. But that's okay. They can still survive. But if it happens, such abnormalities happen in dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior, usually such organisms don't survive. They will, they will be aborted. So what happens during early development? As I said, first is cell proliferation. Cells divide. They attach to each other, so cell adhesion. Then they also migrate from one place to another. So essentially, the brain-forming cells are not always present in the future anterior side. Cells do lot of motility inside the embryo. 
and cells also differentiate because some have to become islets of Ranger and others have to become keratinocytes and so on. And ultimately, in our embryonic development, cells also die. They undergo apoptosis. All these processes that you see exclusively in an vertebrate embryo, including ours, are seen in an adult. So you can imagine why it is so interesting for embryologists and biologists in general. Because you can study embryonic processes in an adult organ. So there are many things. There is one more peculiar thing of Hydra, which interests others, is something that I'll mention subsequently. But before that, let me tell you why Hydra can do this and possibly remain young. And the reason is that it has stem cells. So just to put things in perspective, what do we mean by stem cell? A stem cell is a cell which can self-renew and is also capable of differentiating into one, two or different cell types. So here is a case of hematopoietic stem cell, which can differentiate, which can, uh, sorry, uh, uh, embryonic stem cell, which can self-replicate, so it undergoes mitosis, but it can also differentiate into various cell types, like erythrocytes, neurons, muscle cells, and so on. So these are the primary characteristics how you can call it a stem cell. And if you look at the hematopoietic stem cell lineage in our body, in our bone marrow, then you will see that this is the HSC for short, hematopoietic stem cell. And then it undergoes a number of steps of differentiation to finally get the cells that are present in our blood circulation. Right? So this is, this is one multipotent progenitor that can give rise to the lymphocytes. The other can give rise to various kinds of, you know, erythrocytes, neutrophils, even platelets. But please remember that this is a very complex process by which a stem cell is converted into a particularly differentiated progeny. It's not as if it is a single stem. Because a single stem cell in our, hemat um, our bone marrow can give rise to different kinds of blood cells. And therefore, it's a, we call it a multipotent stem cell population. It has multiple potency. It can differentiate into many cell types. These cells, only differentiated cells come out of our bone marrow. If undifferentiated cells come out of the bone marrow, we usually call it leukemia. Okay? Because stem cells should not enter uh, blood. So this is just to give you a perspective of the stem cells that we have in the body. But Hydra also has stem cells. So usually we think about ourselves as very special. But whatever we have, Punjas and Hydra also seem to have. And Hydra... Specifically, the organism Hydra is believed to be at least 60 million years old. So you can imagine that many things that we have in the body have already evolved 60 million years back. So there are two stem cell populations which give rise to the two epithelia. One is epiderm ectodermal stem cell population. The other is endodermal epithelial stem cell population. And these cells usually recycle in about three to four days. And when... if when they terminally differentiate, they are only in the extremities, like tentacles and foot. All other cells here, as you can see here, are actually stem cells, but they are also carrying out the function of epithelium. Usually stem cells have the function of only differentiating into somatic cells. Here, these cells are stem cells, but also carrying out somatic function of epithelia. So probably we are looking at evolution of stem cells themselves. And therefore, people are obviously interested in finding out as to how this happens. This is about epithelia. But I told you that in addition to that, Hydra has many different kinds of cells. It has four types of stinging cells or nematocytes. It has sensory neurons, ganglionic neurons. It has uh, gland cells, mucus cells. But in addition to that, I told you that Hydra can go for sexual reproduction if conditions are unfavorable. That means it has to produce gametes also, ovum and sperm. And for that, there is a third stem cell population, which is known as interstitial cells, or eye cells for short. And these cycle very fast because they have to give rise to a large number of cells. So these cycle in about 1.5 days. And you can see that they can give rise not only to somatic cells, but also to the gametes. So they are, again, truly multipotent. And these, this body column here, middle of the body column, is loaded with eye cells. They are present in the ectoderm, and they continuously divide, migrate, differentiate, and undergo apoptosis. So these three stem cell populations continuously provide new cells 
so that the old cells are replaced and the hydra as an organism defies aging okay are you with me so far right and the final most interesting characteristic is regeneration so if you take a hydra and this is a picture from saroj gaskarvi's lab wherein they took this indian hydra cut it into three pieces okay you can see that the top piece has regenerated the lost foot the middle piece has regenerated both the head and the foot and the lower piece has regenerated the lost head so the head and the foot uh, in the extreme pieces is regenerated in about 3 days and the middle piece takes about 5 days to regenerate the lost body part because it has to regenerate both head and foot okay so it has tremendous capacity of regeneration let me explain regeneration in hydra a little in a little more detail and that will also explain to you as to how certain basic principles in biology we have learned from this organism so take a hydra cut it into two pieces the top piece will regenerate the lost foot the bottom piece will regenerate the lost head but you will notice that the regenerated hydra are smaller than the original one that is because initial stages of regeneration in hydra involve only wound healing and regeneration it doesn't involve growth and therefore cells here which are which are actually in part of the middle of the body column now change their developmental fate and become foot and likewise in this case cells which were neighbors of the cells here they somehow sense that they have to form a head and not a foot so that's very interesting how do they know this likewise if you take and cut it into three pieces as i showed you in the earlier slide this piece regenerates head and this uh, head and foot both but whatever you do with this middle piece the head will regenerate always on the side where the original head was present and the foot always on the side where the original foot was present right so from by looking at such experiments and also looking at uh, limb regeneration in chick embryo a scientist louis walford propose the theory of positional information and morphogen gradients so what he proposed is that there are gradients there are protein gradients usually so let's take this example if you cut the hydra he, he imagined that there are gradients so head he imagined four molecules okay one is head activator that means in this piece for example head is active head activator you know functions in such a way that new head is formed in the this piece there is foot activator so that a foot is formed but he also imagined two more molecules one is head inhibitor that is foot inhibitor so what i'll explain this this is a little uh, complicated to understand so head forming molecules is highest here and goes on falling in concentration as you go down foot forming molecule is highest here and will go on falling as you go up you understand this otherwise i could have used the chalk so wherever you cut the hydra the head forming molecule will be always higher on the side of the original head and likewise for the foot so that actually instructs the cells at the cut edge what developmental fate to be taken then why did walpert imagine two more molecules is because unless you have an head inhibitor there is a possibility and danger of forming more than one head we have one head we have 10 fingers two hands two legs all that comes from the kind of morphogen gradients and positional information that we have in the embryo when the positional information when the head activator when the head inhibitor is not there which was probably the case in was the case in ke uh, ravan so he got 10 head i'm using mythological uh, figure only to make the point okay so what i'm trying to tell you is that everything is normal in our case is no accident there is a very fine regulation in development but to understand these processes in complex organisms like us we cannot obviously use human embryos so we have to use organisms like hydra and hydra has given us the entire theory of morphogen gradients and positional information what i mean by positional so these uh, molecules form a gradient a concentration gradient 
but positional information means in a gradient every cell here actually identif can identify its position depending on how much dose of the molecule it is getting because only the cells which have a specific receptor for example insulin will act on cells where insulin receptor is present likewise these morphogens also act on cells where their receptors are specifically present and that is how they know their position in a gradient now their position cells here have position in the middle of the body column but once you cut them their position is changed cells here now know their position is at the foot level so they activate genes which are required for forming proteins so that foot is formed have you have you followed this any questions then you can have a very tiny hydra with small piece of hydra okay because we can make let's say 20 30 pieces of a single hydra every one will regenerate into a new hydra firstly it is small then it grows in size uh, not only that if you completely separate the cells of hydra by using trypsin or edda even a small pellet of hydra can regenerate into an entire organ and the smallest pellet with which hydra has been regenerated is only 100 cells imagine the hydra is 100000 cells but only 100 cells provided the pellet has i cells the third multipotent stem cell population it can regenerate into a new hydra and these are not very difficult experiments we do, do them in the lab we keep a pellet the pellet becomes a hydra in a few days right so it has such tremendous capacity of regeneration and no wonder people want to know how it has so much uh, regeneration capacity and whether we can pick up some trip, uh, tricks from hydra which can be used at least for in vitro you know regeneration of organ <clears throat> okay so i have told you uh, given you an idea about this model system and i am now going to give you a flavor of what we do i am not going to load you with too much of technical details but what we do and how it could be relevant to regenerative uh, biology uh, do you have any questions so far or we can take questions at the end whatever yes please so i regeneration what is so hydra during regeneration doesn't feed this experiment can i do it in many schools also i just go there cut my hydra leave it there in 3 4 days they see regeneration it doesn't feed because there is no growth it doesn't need any food okay once it forms the tentacles it starts feeding then you have to provide food and it will then grow to the normal size that's why hydra is very small to begin with after regeneration no food so only if salt only may sorry so there is initially when you take a cut there is wound healing which is a must for any kind of regeneration and there is reorganization of the cells that cells use whatever energy or the, is already there inside they use it they don't need anything to eat that yes please so this is basically you get them in all the pods as i said i collected from the pond so in a um, lab also we tried to simulate that we have salts and buffers that's all simple but feeding you have to give them live prey they don't feed on dead prey so you have to actually give daphnia cyclops or what we usually do where all over the world they do it so we have to follow the same standard you get artemia cysts okay you hatch them out you get small larvae out of it and we feed them and they they go on eating it yes please i have a question yeah right the cells themselves are not oriented there is a gradient of extracellular molecule within the cell there is in the cell so that's the beauty of the system because if there is something within the cell it cannot change its state the instructions are in the intercellular spaces every cell has all the genes so depending on the instructions it gets it will activate those genes like in our case even today in my skin cell all genes are there even for insulin but it's not activated 
So signals are extracellular. What? Yes. That the jury is still out. We don't know. Those are only connective tissue cells. So we don't know. Actually, mesoderm uh, that we see in vertebrates and in us is because of the invagination of the ectoderm itself. So, but there are, I mean, uh, some genes here which are required for mesoderm formation in humans. But these genes are doing an entirely different function here. So it's a very complex system. But mesoglia is certainly, mesoglia give rise, is, gives rise to only connective tissue. Doesn't give rise to cell types. Yes. What are the? Okay, so uh, the rates of DNA mutation should not be very different from other organisms, generally speaking. But the problem is the cell is thrown out, the mutant cell. So you get very few mutants in Hydra. Stable mutants are very difficult to get in Hydra. There are just four and five. Four or five which are well characterized. For the same reason, occurrence of cancer is very rare in height. They do get spontaneous tumors. So this is the first multicellular organism in evolution which can get spontaneous tumors. And we are now thinking about how you can see cancer pathways in Hydra, but hardly any cancer there. And the reason is the same. If you have a cancerous cell in Hydra, it will probably be replaced. So there is probably no time to form the tumor. But still there are two or three reported cases from very good lab, a nature paper also, wherein they do get spontaneous tumors. Because they are all exposed to the carcinogens that we are exposed to. Not only that, Saroj and I have also shown that they have the entire DNA repair machinery, including xeroderma pigmentosum. They obviously don't get xeroderma pigmentosum, but they have an nucleotide exigen repair and base oxygen repair, everything is in place. So that's what I say, when people say that we are very special, other than listening to classical music, we are not very different from Hydra. Isn't it? I mean, that is cultural evolution, but biological evolution wise, it has everything and I'll just show you, prove it further. So I have some 15 minutes more. Yeah, okay. So let me, okay, okay. So let me, <laughs> okay. So till midnight, Sunday. Okay. So this is uh, what we have been doing in Hydra Biology in uh, Agarkar. I work in Agarkar Research Institute. Before that, I used to work on chick and frog embryos mainly. But at some point, you know, and one of the interests in the lab was how our nervous system is induced. See, our nervous system comes from the ectoderm. But how do a subset of ectodermal cells no, not consciously. How do they know that they have to become nervous system? That's a very important question, and it is still not resolved. And vertebrate embryos, for some reason, uh, for obvious reasons, are very complex. So after the bird flu event, uh, we did not get very good early chick embryo. And also, uh, frog embryos are seasonal. So if the referee asked us to do an experiment, we had to wait till the next month, because we don't breed frogs in India. So at some point, we thought that Hydra might be a good choice to look at how nervous system evolves, because this is the first organism to have nervous system. Okay, so uh, this is just reiteration of what I said. Estimated to be 600 million years old, Nidarian, but Hydra specifically, by using various techniques of you know DNA uh, barcoding and so on, it is known that it is at, at least 60 million years old. And as I said, it's the first organism to have an organized nervous system. Sponges do not have neurons. Hydra has not only neurons, but also a nerve net spread all over its body. So one of the interests in our lab was to find out how the first nervous system evolved. So that is how we started off uh, in the year 2000. So I'll be, I'm just going to give you one case of how we found an important molecule from Hydra. We have found several, but this is the first um, experiment in the lab and the first student who reluctantly joined because this was the only lab hydra lab in india now there are four or five more but that time it was a risky project because nobody knew about hydra biology except me i had used it for my phd also but uh, nobody else knew so to explain the how nervous system is formed 
I'm, I have taken the case of frog embryo. This is very similar in our case also. Okay, so you can imagine frog embryo. You must have studied at some point in your biology. So you have the prospective ectoderm, prospective endoderm. When we start our life, only there is ectoderm and endoderm. There is no mesoderm. Mesoderm comes into existence later during embryonic development because of the interaction between these cells and these. So certain signals go from endoderm to ectoderm so that cells here, which we call as marginal zone, become mesoderm. This doesn't happen in Hydra. I'm talking about frog here. That is one thing. Now, this mesoderm has to be uh, specified into dorsal and ventral mesoderm because we have to form dorsal and ventral. So that happens because of certain molecules which are shown here. These are known as cordine, noggin, polystatin. You need not remember the name, names except for noggin because that is what I'm going to talk about. So this group of cells here which are shown in fluorescent green are actually the ones which secrete these molecules. And these molecules are inhibitors of the BMP pathway, bone morphogenetic protein pathway, BMP. BMP pathway is active in all the embryonic cells as a default pathway, always active. Okay? But wherever BMP pathway is inhibited, those cells become dorsal. That's one part. The other important part is wherever BMP pathway is inhibited in the ectodermal cell, those become our nervous system. So for neurons to form, BMP pathway needs to be inhibited. And this is done by these three molecules. And these are secreted molecules. So what they do is they bind to BMP molecule and inhibit it from binding to its own receptor so that the signaling is inhibited. So we thought of looking at noggin if it is present in Hydra. That's how we started off the work. And one student from Nasi Kalpana, she uh, started doing this. And by using simple bioinformatics, this was 20 years back, and we also didn't have any fancy. Bioinformatics it, itself was not very common. So by using the simple bioinformatics tool, she found out that the amino acid sequence of Hydra is fairly similar especially from the point of view of the cysteine residues, which are important for its function. Very similar to, uh, so okay, this is Gallus means chick, Xenopus is frog, Homo sapiens is us, and Danio is uh, zebrafish. So Hydra, nog Hydra seemed to have something that was very similar to our noggin. We were very excited about this. Then she used another bioinformatics tools to find out three-dimensional structure of noggin. And you can see that this is our noggin, human noggin, frog noggin, uh, sea urchin noggin, and hydra noggin. And you see that there is a fairly close similarity. Although there are certain differences here, there's a couple of uh, loops are not there, but uh, you need not bother about that. Overall, if you see an organism which evolved 60 million years back already has a molecule which is important in our case for brain formation, nervous system formation. So we were sure that there is something like noggin in Hydra, at least at the structural level. So at the DNA and the amino acid level, nucleotide and amino acid level, it was there. But the next question was, is it functional? Is it functionally conserved? Or it is only structurally conserved? For that, we decided to do an experiment. OK? So what? is already known in hydra, uh, in frog, fish, and chick embryo, is that if you overexpress these molecules, if you provide them in excess, then what you get is two heads, duplication of axis in a normal frog embryo, if you give it, OK? Then what we decided was that instead of giving frog noggin to the frog embryo, if we give hydra noggin, can it do the similar function? Do you understand the experiment? Quite straightforward. So we take a control group without any treatment. In the second group, we inject, micro-inject. This is done in very early embryos. We micro-inject hydra noggin messenger RNA. Because Kalpana had already cloned it by then. Okay. And in the positive control, we inject xenopus noggin itself in excess. Because that is a positive control. 
So on one hand, you have a negative control, a positive control, and your experimental group is embryos injected with hydranogen messenger RNA. So we got, in 100% of the cases, we got duplication of axis. We didn't get head per se, but you can see here that we got two axis, two dorsal ventral axis, indicating that hydranogen messenger RNA, in fact, got translated into frog embryonic cells and actually induce the new axis, dorsal ventral axis. But uh, these kinds of experiments are fairly common, and uh, uh, we wanted to make uh, you know, the study more interesting and the paper more acceptable to a good journal. So what we did was we went one step further. And this is because of our background of developmental biology. And this is a picture from a famous book, Gilbert's book. What it shows is that this is a normal, normal tadpole of genomes. If you overexpress noggin in this, there are more, dors more and more dorsal structures formed. In developmental biology terms, we call it dorsalization of the embryo. So you can see here, as it becomes, you get more and more dorsal structures, but the development is affected. The pigmentation is increased because dorsal structures are pigmented. Okay? But there is another interesting experiment that was reported some 80, 90 years back in frog embryo, which I knew. And that experiment is that if you irradiate the early frog embryo with UV, then dorsal structures do not form. So the embryo actually becomes more and more ventralized. You see lots of pigmentation. So what we then decided to do is to irradiate early frog embryos with UV and see if injection of noggin, either from Xenopus itself or from Hydra, will rescue the phenotype. That means, will it neutralize, at least to some extent, effects of UV? Will it titrate out the effects of UV? So this is what we got. And you can see these are the uninjected normal tadpoles, the uh, master control. This is normal development. But if you irradiate the early embryos with UV, they become ventralized, as you can see. Right? But along with UV, if we inject either Xenopus noggin mRNA or Hydra noggin mRNA, we get rescue, partial rescue of phenotype. So you can see here, this is Hydra noggin at 50 picogram per embryo, 100 picogram per embryo. This is Xenopus noggin at 5 and 10 picogram per embryo. So Hydra noggin is required in 10 times more concentration, but it still works. We, we believe that there are many secondary you know, molecules which may be playing a role, so we need more concentration. But this gave us a clear-cut proof that Hydra noggin is not only structurally, but functionally quantum. So the molecule which is required for the formation of the nervous system in human beings is already there in place in Hydra. Now the um, the, the problem here is we don't know whether it really participates in nervous system formation in Hydra. But we know that it is functionally quantum. And this is just to show that uh, it actually inhibits BMP. So mechanism is the same. As you can see here, BMP plus Hydra noggin, BMP plus Xenopus noggin, and you don't get a mesodermal marker, which is known as brachiuri. X stands for Xenopus. So you get absence of them. So this is to prove that it not only proves the phenotype, but it proves the phenotype by following the same molecular mechanism of inhibiting BMP. So from that, we know that noggin is functionally already evolved 60 million years back. Okay, so uh, I will not go further into that. We have carried out experiments to find out what the role of noggin could be in Hydra, and we think it is in the development of the tentacle. But those data I will not... Uh, bother you with because that is probably too technical and not for today's discussion. So evolution and survival of multicellular organisms depend on close coordination between their constituent cells. That is why we become successful as a multicellular organism because there is division of labor. But the cells have to coordinate with each other and for that they must communicate with one another. And we now know that in all the organisms that you see, all animals, there are these seven basic signaling pathways that operate in all cells, and these are sufficient 
for the cells to communicate with one another. I am talking about only signaling pathways. I am not talking about neural signaling, okay, or hormonal signaling. That is in addition to this. This is only cell-to-cell -cell signaling in a paracrine fashion. That means signaling to their neighbors. So these are TJ beta, Wnt, Hedgehog, Notch, Jack, Strat, and so on. Okay. So now what people would like to know is if the same pathways are present in Hydra, if similar cells are present, then why it can regenerate so much and we have lost the capacity of regeneration. And we know that with evolution of complex structures, animals have lost the capacity of regeneration. So the first thing that Hydra biologists would like to know is to compare the stem cells from Hydra, interstitial stem cells, with cells from higher organisms or more complex organisms. I won't call it higher because I think Hydra is very high as far as I'm concerned, okay. not lower. So which regulatory events or signal pathways control the transformation of the stem cell into a differentiated cell? If you remember the hematopoietic stem cells I showed you, I sh told you that there are several steps in which cells will differentiate. How does a progenitor know that it has to for, uh, form lymphocytes and not erythrocytes. Because it gets signals from the neighbors, and that's how it takes one pathway or other. Engineering or medicine, science, commerce, or arts, these kinds of decisions are taken. Of course, we have different kinds of signals from home, but these are different things. Okay? So what are those signals? What are those instructions? Because depending on the instructions, Certain genes will be activated and others will be deactivated. Then how do stem cells in the basal metagen? Basal means right at the base of, uh, you know, multicellularity. I showed you the tree. Differ from stem cells in bilateral. Where are bilaterials? Left, right, symmetry. Okay. What are the differences? What are the similarities? And are certain features common to all cells? And whether if they are common, how common they are, and how we can use those features to expand human stem cell population in vitro and probably go for subsequent stages to form organs in vitro. Another thing I didn't mention specifically, but a large number of genes encoding various proteins in Hydra show remarkable similarities with genes in vertebrates, including humans. So they don't show similarity with Drosophila or Cynorhabditis worm genes, which are very popular model system, but they are similar to us. And we don't know why that is so. Okay. These include genes, including transcription factors, which activate, you know, genes, cell signaling molecules, like noggin, for example, I showed you, and DNA repair proteins that we have also shown. It has all the genes for nucleotide DNA repair. So, actually, uh, just I'll passingly mention that we have a protein called XPA, xeroderma pigmentosum A. You know, you have A to G and G. There are eight of them. So XPA is a protein which is necessary for nucleotide oxygen repair. When we isolated uh, XPA, we collaborated with a Japanese scientist who had XP deficient cell lines. So what is XP? Xeroderma pigmentosum is a disease by which nucleotide DNA repair becomes deficient as a result of which these people get skin cancers because of exposure to UV. Okay, so these XPA deficient cell lines were provided with Hydra XPA mRNA and we got rescue of those cells. So they could now repair UV damage to some extent. So it is really very homologous with us. So they show a lot of similarity with human genes. This shows that basic toolkit of genes, I told you that Hydra almost has everything that we have, is millions of years old. Various proteins sometimes perform the same function in these diverse groups of animals. Take the example of noggin. It does the same thing here. Inhibition of BMP pathway also does the same thing in humans. The consequences may be different, different, but the mechanism is the same. But many a times, some proteins that you see in Hydra have taken up an entirely different function. And just, again, I will mention an example from the lab. Hydra has a gene, Hydra has a gene and protein called vascular endothelial growth factor. You may have heard about VEGF, which is required for angiogenesis 
formation of blood vessel. But Hydra doesn't have blood because blood is Mr. Dumb. Then what is VEGF doing there? We find that VEGF is important in branching. So in blood vessel formation and in neurogenesis, it is required for branching in human. But there also it is required for branching. But later on, it has been recruited for something entirely different. I also mentioned a molecule called Bracuri. Bracuri is a mesoderm formation molecule in us. But Bracuri is present in Hydra. It is required for hair formation. Hydra doesn't have mesoderm. But Bracuri initially must have evolved for a different function. Then it was recruited for mesoderm formation. So these insights also you get as to how proteins have acquired new functions. So some proteins have used the same function, some proteins have added functions, some proteins have entirely different. And just last couple of slides, I told you that uh, with evolution of complex structures, our capacity of regeneration has gone down. For example, humans can regenerate liver, maybe pancreas to some extent, isn't it? We don't regenerate other organs. Uh, it is believed that young rats and even human infants can sometimes regenerate digits of kingdom. But that's very rare. But that's possible at very early stage. Of See, regeneration is after our recapitulation of embryonic development. Many of the events take place there. One of the theories, popular theories of why we have lost regeneration is that every time regeneration event takes place, cells have to again enter mitosis. And then there is always a chance of losing control over mitosis, leading to tumorigenesis and carcinogenesis. That's one of the popular theories. So here uh, you see three animals which show tremendous amount of regeneration. One is Hydra. I showed you that if you cut it, there is initially wound healing, which is shown in uh, green. And then there is differentiation. I told you there is no mitosis, there is nothing else. So it's a very small, very less complicated two-step process. If you go to planaria, an organism that has also a great ability of regeneration, you can cut a planarian into 256 pieces. It will form 256 new planaria. But there, there is one more step that is added, and that is what is known as blastema formation. That means the cut place cells are modified to an extent. We will not go into technical detail. But if you go to the limb regeneration or tail re regeneration of amphibians and reptiles, you must have seen wall lizard shedding its tail. It can regenerate it. There, it's even more complex. So what happens is initially there is wound healing. Wound healing has to be there because there is a cut. Followed by de-differentiation of cells. So imagine I'm an amphibian and you cut my hand. Just imagine. Huh? So if my hand is cut here, right, then this remaining portion is to be regenerated. So cells here, which are differentiated, will have to undergo de-differentiation. Because unless they undergo de-differentiation, they cannot divide. If they don't divide, they cannot form new structure. So this portion undergoes, cells here undergo de-differentiation. They form a modified structure called blastema. And then new cells, once again, because of the gradients that are present here, will form a proper hand. That is what happens in case of amphibians. But this capacity we have lost. And as development uh, evolution progressed, regeneration also became more and more complex. I think the steps are there also to you know, control growth. Because if you lose control over growth, then it will lead to tumor. So all these are being compared by different labs at the molecular and cellular level to find out. Yes? Uh, no, no, the, the colors represent these events, not time scales, essentially. Okay, this is probably my last slide, and this I got only yesterday. There was an EMBO meeting on regeneration in September, you know, European Molecular Biology Organization, and this is the meeting report. I found it interesting because all these model systems, speaker spoke on all these model systems. So you write from Punjas, Hydra, Insects, octopus, fish, amphibians, mouse, and human beings. Everywhere regeneration is being studied in different labs. And you can see here that there are uh, more number of papers on uh, mouse, basically. Also, zebrafish. 
So ZebraFish is a very peculiar model system. ZebraFish, you can remove 60% of its heart and it regenerates its heart completely. Very few animals which can regenerate heart and ZebraFish is one of them. We have a ZebraFish lab in um, Agarkar and one of my colleagues works on that. So this is a tremendous uh, model system wherein you can study regeneration of heart. Therefore, you can see there are obviously large number of papers. Then also regeneration in humans. So there are, all these models are being studied. Now, uh, although it seems that you can pick up some tricks from Hydra and use them in humans, obviously it is not all that simple. But knowledge, fundamental knowledge from all these model systems can possibly be synthesized some way so that we have some hints uh, in uh, regenerative medicine. Noggin is an organ, uh, Noggin is a molecule that is widely used for differentiation of bone marrow cells into differentiation. Why did it come into that mixture? Is because we know it from developmental biology. So that is the connection between fundamental studies and their possible applications. And it takes a long time to do that. And therefore, more often than not, Nobel Prize winners are very old. Right? Because it takes a while from, bed, uh, from lab to bed. Bedside. This I will not, this is not an advertisement, but we have started Hydra kit. We supply it at, uh, because it's a good model for practicals with animal ethics, people uh, not allowing people to use um, animals. Hydra, you can demonstrate budding, you can demonstrate regeneration and so on. That. And many labs in India use that kit now. Okay, so anyone of you who's interested in knowing about Hydra at a very basic level, this article is there in uh, resonance, freely downloadable about Hydra. Then this is something about all cell signaling molecules work that we have done. And I didn't talk about DNA repair, just passingly mentioned it. That's also there in this frontiers. Uh, but these are some of the papers you might look up if you want. But this is the simplest in which I have given any protocols also wherein you can do small experiments, small projects, summer projects, and so on. And this is finally the lab, the funding agencies. Over the years, you know, you can see a lot of women power. People talk now, but my lab has always been powered by women. And you can also see the PI, that is me. Although I work on an organism which doesn't age, I go on aging. Okay, I'll stop here and take questions. Anybody? Yes. Oh, this is your not the first one. Oh, good. Wint. Wingless is Drosophila. The same, it is the homologue of wingless, but the muta mutation in uh, Drosophila is wingless, which, by the way, is reported from. India many years ago. VL Chopra reported Wingless. Yes. Yeah, it's a wind pathway. The entire wind pathway is present in Hydra. It is homologous with the uh, Drosophila Wingless. And in Hydra, its role is slightly different. It is important for head formation. Actually, I was expecting a question when I said that there are gradients in Hydra. And then I said that even a pellet can give rise to Hydra. But then if there are no gradients, because Hydra, when you make a pellet, all gradients are broken. How does the head develop? So people have shown that there are certain cells in this pellet which start expressing wind, and that becomes the head, and then the remaining thing uh, fall into place. Sir, you mentioned about Hydra. Now, uh, from my mind, hearing about every so Hydra basically has many antibacterial peptides, but immune system is kind of still in flux like the stem cell. It has half TLR, not the food. So you, this is an organism where things are still on the gas. In the, yeah, they're still being cooked, kind of. So half TLR is there, certain immune uh, molecules are there, 
but no immune system per se. It is only antimicrobial peptides. Yeah, yeah, huh. it can certainly recognize self and non-self. You know, if you mix sponge cells from a green sponge and a uh, red sponge, they sort themselves out. Ah, otherwise, our uh, liver cells and pancreatic cells will mix, no? So this is very important, cell sorting. So Hydra also, Saroj has done that experiment. She has transplanted piece from a uh, uh, brown Hydra onto a green Hydra and vice versa. They spit it out within seconds. They know self and non. So it's there at the level of the cell surface. Sorting, sorting out is very important. If you mix liver and kidney cells from mouse embryo, they will sort themselves out. If you mix liver cells from cheek embryo and mouse embryo, they will not sort themselves out because they have the similar molecules. They will sort themselves out because they are different species. But at the cellular level, they have very similar molecules. Developmental biology is very interesting. I mean, every branch is interesting. Yes. No, no, the, the, the gradient is full, no, entire, throughout the entire uh, cylinder. Everything else is body column. Except for the, so there are three parts of the body. We have head, thorax, abdomen. Hydra has head, foot, and body column. And within the body column, there are further gradients. Which will they? Yeah. So gradients are many. For example, if uh, if there is an anterior posterior gradient in our my body, it is not enough to compartmentalize it further. Then you need more refinement of the chemical. Kind of, but not. Uh, I mean, we don't know whether hydra is segmented. Yes, we are segmented certainly, as you can see from the ribs and the vertebral column, not the six packs. Yes, there is a question at the back. Uh, to an extent, it can be used because it has many of the, uh, you know, uh, neuropeptides and all are present there. But you cannot completely simulate it because there is no nervous system per se. It's only a simple nervous system. So that complexity of, you know, structure of the brain is not there. It's a very simple structure. But... Yeah, basic research is being done there. Yes. Any? What? Dosage form. Why would it be used? No. Why? It's it's. Uh, these are just simple cells. Unless. You, you, I mean, unless you isolate certain principles, like you use many anti-cancer drugs from sponges. If you isolate a specific molecule, and then you can think of usage. So we, uh, so regeneration itself is an extremely complex process. It is not only a single molecule that is there. So what one can do is one can identify the molecule, and if similar molecules are not present in human, one can synthesize them. But you cannot use molecules from Hydra because that would they would not function. I also showed you in Xenopus, we need ten types of the molecule because it will not be functional there because the in, see any molecule for it to work, it has to have many different molecules along with it. It's a network. So probably the best thing is to use a synthetic derivative, uh, synthetic, you know, a molecule of similar kind. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so Hydra has um, sexual reproduction, it is very similar to all organisms that uh, have external fertilization. So the oocyte, oocyte is released, 
and sperms are released and fertilization takes place in water like it does in case of frog or you know sea urchin embryo so for that it is quite similar to other organisms asexual reproduction is of course a different ball game altogether but for certain initial stages of fertilization probably it can certainly be, be used to find out how fertilization process itself evolved because it has become very complex in our case and um, there also self and non self has to be there because if you put two sea urchin uh, embryos together uh, sea urchin uh, individuals together they will never cross fertilize because sperms and eggs have recognition molecule yes Yeah, in many cases that is the case, but more often than not they are conjured, but maybe not in this case. We'll have to discuss this further. Certainly, where do you work? Okay, okay, uh huh. Sure, we can uh, discuss this further. What do you want exactly? I haven't understood. Possibly, we can discuss this further. Radioactive. That's a bit difficult in Hydra because where will you put the radioactivity? You'll have to put it in the medium. See, this is a just a cylinder of cells. So even injecting DNA is very difficult. You can inject it in one cell, but not what you do in uh, what you do in uh, embryo, for example. So to make transgenic Hydra, we have to actually make them go for sexual reproduction. Inject the transgene in the embryo. Then sometimes it gets. So these are very complex experiments, but I'm sure they can be done. We can discuss this further. Basana, please. I thank Dr. Vikram Banji for the fascinating lecture. I'm a doctor. Okay. And uh, I found this very fascinating. There are quite a few questions here. I'll try to answer. I don't know. Well, uh, first one is that um, the molecules that you see in uh, animals, one doesn't see in plant because the plant, in most cases, it's not regeneration. 
plant cells are good. Yeah. So it's a so you can take a single cell and you get the plant. These cells that they they don't be then. No, they regenerate, but the, 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 the reason they have regeneration is their potency. Here, what one is to do is to change differentiated cells into different, so it has okay. to be trans differentiation. In plants, you know, they already have the capacity to differentiate between multiple cell types. Green hydra, it is green because it has chlorella, which is a different organism. It's an endosymbiote. So it has nothing to do with hydrocele. It has nothing to do with chlorophyll. No, no uh, chlorella is their own chlorophyll. That's why they look green. But hydra is a hydra. So you can remove uh, chlorella from green hydra, provided you eat them for a month in darkness. But they bounce back as soon as they see them. But chlorella, chlorella gets protection inside hydra cells. And hydra probably gets some image. I don't know if I have answered it. No. I mean, they are yeah. almost not answering, but I said something. <laughs> I should not ask that question. I was able to check to ask that question. Sir, sorry, la last question. What? <laughs> I, I can. Uh, so, uh, you talked about uh, apoptosis in uh, Hydra. Uh, so, uh, you said that. Uh, after 20 days, that cells come to an end of that uh, tentacles extremities and then they shed off uh, after programmed cell death. So, uh, my first question is uh, Is that uh, mechanism it's similar to humans at, at a molecular level? Spider like human. there are pro apoptotic molecules and yes. anti apoptotic. Okay. So, and my also, second question is also had which is very similar to the Okay. So my second question is, uh, are there any sensory molecules which ask that, I mean, which trigger apoptosis into the cells because they get, apo they undergo apoptosis only when they come to extreme. There must be, but they are not all not not yeah. The mechanism is likely to be very, very similar. Okay. Because, see, one of these very nice mechanisms have been developed in evolution. Mm -hmm. There is no point in doing it all over again. So the same mechanisms have been used, like signaling molecules. There are only seven pathways which are good enough to build the hydra or a sponge or even in. But they are used at different times of our life in different contexts. So wind is very important in hydra, which also leads to carcinogenesis in humans. But there it's very rare because, the, because of the turnover of cells. So hydra is a very peculiar system for that. So, talking about Hydra, the interesting thing is very easy. Working with people. You get good phenotypes, but you can't explain it. Sir, can nutrition accelerate the regeneration of Hydra? No, in, in case of regeneration, there is no PD. But budding, we can accelerate. Nutrition, because our cells just don't take up any nutrients during regeneration. Whatever is there inside the cells is enough. They don't need nutrition. So, uh, it doesn't accelerate, even if you provide. Because, see, Hydra needs food which has to be live. So it has to eat it, digest it, kill it, and so on. So, sir, if, if you are any of your collaborator needs Hydra, so mm -hmm. do you add externally vascular and the growth factor for external budding and then you bud them? No, we just feed them. So, okay. So, I mean, uh, you accelerate actually. There is an experiment coming up where we need let's say 10,000. Hmm. We feed them more, they eat more. If they eat more, they produce more cells. Okay. If they produce more cells, they will produce more cells. Okay, but in number. So inducing uh, growth in Hydra by isolating BGM would be not possible financially. <laughs> Living cell aspect. Like how in evolution, we uh, do study that mitochondria came into existence in our cell much later after these uh, complex cities were on. See, mitochondria came into existence, mitochondria, um, what is there in plants? 
and mitochondria. Essentially, according to Lin Margulis theory, which is the most popular, these these are bacteria which were entered by a vegan. And that's how that's how both of them are being entered. Otherwise, why should mitochondria be here? This is where we understand this theory that mitochondria and chloroplasts are illegal bacteria which have remained there as organisms. That is a fair development. Otherwise, we wouldn't get mitochondria and chlorophyll inside us. They wouldn't have their own nuclear bacteria. So mitochondrial DNA is separate from the theory. And all mitochondria, by the way, is humans come from mother. You know that. So you can place the maternal DNA. Whatever mitochondria we have, it must be from Lucy. <laughs> I have a question. I don't know how that is. My background is nutrition, and therefore, really. Already they have food and food. Are nutrition depletion and depletion studies possible in environment? You said they consume food. Well, you can, if you, if you deplete Hydra with food, it actually is a trigger for you to go for sexual networks. Okay, and the reason could be, I'm just guessing here, that they, need, they produce embryos. Outside, and the, it is likely that the embryo will disperse and end up in a place where more food is there. That's the only logical explanation there could be. But otherwise, total uh, depletion of nuclear will kill. But that, uh, that is not natural, it is because of starvation. But starvation also induces autophagy in hydra as it does in our cells. So, uh... Where is the regenerate, regenerate medicine going and what are the human applications from regeneration biology? I am really not very really I am not at all competent to say that, but I guess it's making very good progress. But uh, like stem cell biology, it's easier said than done. You put some stem cells, you don't know how they will behave. So likewise, you know, regeneration, 3D printing and all is being done and people are printing organs. So from that point of view, I think it's progressing well, but all that is based on our knowledge from normal data. That much I can tell you. Because otherwise we won't know which molecules we use. All these cocktails of uh, growth factors that people use, for uh, example, in NCCs, the entire work is based on development. Because you know what is to be fed to the cells to differentiate into one or the other pathway, or even um, allow them to you know, divide continuous. So, regenerative medicine is certainly stem cell biology. These are, these cannot be separate. For example, I can just give you one example that people are now using, um, for example, take a diabetic patient and if the islets of diabetes are not working and you can introduce differentiated langer of that, uh, islets of langer and into the patient which are derived from his own skin cells. Because we know from the experiments like Dolly that you can take a differentiated cell, yeah. convert it into a pluripotent stem cell by Yamanaka factors, who got Nobel Prize in 2012 for that. And then there is no question of self and non-self because the population is from the patient himself. Such trials are indeed going on. But the advantage there is that they are from the cells from the same patient. And since we know how to convert them into stem cells, it, it is now becoming possible. But then again, these are at this point in time, these are very uh, technically challenging and extremely expensive. Yes. Sir, just out of curiosity, what is the role of the cell I didn't say that. Some of the molecules. That would hit me much ahead of time. I broke in there. That's the So, are there any uh, genes that have been conserved from Hydra to influence our cells? Otherwise, how will you get molecules? All these genes are permanent. I told you the example of uh, XP, zero level pigment. Very, very conjured, highly conjured at both 
nucleotide level and in amino acids. In fact, they complement no? if you inject hydra XPA uh, molecule like MRA into human cell, which is deficient, it can make XPA and correct the damage induced by you. Yes, sir. So there is, there is a little gene that is conserved in humans but is not active. Oh, it's present in the human yes, gene. Yes. There are plenty. So we don't know if, like which exact genes are there that have been conserved but are not active. It's not as good as it is. That is why we want new people to come to yes. us. Because all said and done after talking so much, we know that we know Hardly in the Hydra or any other device. See, Hydra genome has been recently uh, sequenced and explored. And if you compare the size, Hydra genome is the same as human genes. Yes, size. It's a huge gene. Except genes are very different. Yet, the rest is cousin. Like, you know, for humans, you have around 30,000 genes. You want to. Yes. So, yes. Yes. So, yes. So, the, basically, it's not, uh, it cannot be used in the sense that if the hydra it, it defies aging because it replaces cells. Now, that we have not, we can't do. But then, uh, so that is the basic difference. But there must be certain tricks to prolong cellular aging in humans. That might help. There are many advertisements also. There are companies who claim that. I don't know whether it will be worthwhile. You become old and then you remain old and then people throw you out. Anything else? What kind of pathogen, like what kind of genes you can observe in the way you are Mostly fungal infection uh, and bacterial infections, but diseases as such, I don't I mean, diseases similar to humans, those are not there because uh, the cellular dynamics is very peculiar. That's why you don't get mutants also. Cancers are also very really rare, but they do cancers, you do get cancer. But diseases uh, like diabetes, one that kind because there is no blood, there is no hormone. Because unless there is blood, there is, cannot be harmed. There are only infections. Infections, they can quickly get infected with fungi and uh, bacteria. But they have microbiome. We have studied the microbiome in detail. They have microbiome. So, even our microbiome, there is nothing special about it. Hydra already has it 60 million years back. If you block off that microbiome, this experiment we have also done in collaboration with Yogesh Chai and Sarod, then they, their body is reduced. So they need microbiome, just like we need microbiome. For even our moods are supposedly controlled by our bacteria. They also. Sir, can we give any therapeutics to them, like any drug? For what? For any testing. Testing. Or oh, they are used as uh, indicators of water pollution, for example. Uh -huh. You can do many experiments with like that. But provided the drug is soluble in water. But as a pollution indicators, they are wine juice. They are fresh water. So if you get some uh, industrial effluent, you will see some changes and there are some assays by which you can grade them how much those are used. So they are aerobic? Aerobic from water. Also there is a lot of relevance of this with corals because they belong to the same phylum. You can't study corals so easy. They belong to the same phylum. Yes, sir. Sir, any antimicrobial study has been done? Antimicrobial resistance. As you said about industrial influence, we collect those influence mm -hmm. from a uh, aquatic uh, part of the industry. So, any antimicrobial resistance has been developed in Hydra in this study? They have antimicrobial peptides. 
But uh, why should they develop antimicrobial resistance? Because nobody has really studied it. So, and this is not they are they are brought to the clinic and I prescribe them and they take this for a long time. And they don't come they don't they don't they don't complete the proportion. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, you know, so, any kind of thing, that's I'm not tired. I'm just very tired. Look at this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, talk, it really helped us understand Hydra at the response. And it's wanting me to take Hydra. <laughs> but before we actually conclude this uh, session, uh, we would like to request uh, Sarojit that we have to give any concluding remarks before I just follow up again. She can say that later this year we have our 40th wedding anniversary. <laughs> So, thank you so much for joining us for this Saturday club. We hope you really enjoyed it. Uh, we look forward to meeting you all in the next month on, on the first Saturday. Please join us for some tea. Thank you. Thank you.